Great, I think I'll, I'll get started now. Um, thank you all so much for joining us today, and thank you also for giving the Chancellor a miss in favour of our panel. We're delighted to see so many of you this afternoon. Um, my name's Madeleine Grant. I'm the parliamentary sketch writer and a columnist at the Daily Telegraph, um, and I'm really delighted to be chairing this panel on energy efficiency held by Conservative Ho Home in partnership with NatWest Group. Um, many thanks to NatWest for all their efforts in making this happen. Um, and what an incredibly timely panel this is, too, as we contend with the dual challenges of meeting our net zero targets in an unstable world while addressing the cost of living at the same time, much of which is driven by soaring energy prices. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before we get going. Um, Con Home is also live streaming this event on their website. Um, so I think we'll be hearing from each of our panelists first, but there will be an opportunity for questions later um, and if you could possibly keep your questions as brief as possible, that would be great. Um, so our discussion is focusing on how improving the energy efficiency of our homes ties in with all of this. Whether decarbonising our homes could not only help our society reach net zero, but also save customers money, including perhaps through things like preferential mortgage rates for greener homes. Um, but all of this is a, you know, a real challenge in the UK, especially where we have the oldest housing stock in, stock in Europe and probably in the world. Um, and making sure that modern new build homes are well insulated is, is one thing, um, but it's quite another to go back and address the drafty Victorian homes, which are the backbone of our housing market. Um, on our pan panel, we have some distinguished guests. Um, we have Lord Callanan, uh, the Minister for Business, Energy and Corporate Responsibility at Bayes. Um, prior to which he served as Minister of State at the Department for Exiting the European Union and as a long-time MEP for the North East England region. Um, I'm delighted also to be joined by David Lindbergh, who is the CEO of retail banking for NatWest Group. Um, the NatWest Group has been at the vanguard of the net zero transition in the UK. They were a principal partner of COP26, a founding member of the Powering Past Coal and are pioneers in green financing. Welcome, David. Um, we also have Adam Scorer, who is the CEO of National Energy Action, a fuel poverty charity. Um, and last but not least, um, we have Jennifer Powers. Um, Jennifer served as a special advisor for business regulation and energy in the number 10 policy unit until September. Um, she has more than 20 years experience in the energy sector under her belt, including work on the net zero transition for Ofgem. Um, well, Chair's privilege says I get to ask a few questions of my own, um, after which I'd like to give open up to the audience for the Q&A. So I think I'm, I might start with, with you, Martin, if I may. Um, a year ago, the government set out its um, heat and building strategy aimed at decarbonizing homes, commercial, industrial, and public sector buildings. I wonder if you might start by giving us you know, a sense of where we are now and what further government measures there are that could be taken to increase uptake of energy efficiency measures in homes. Sure, thank you for the introduction. Very happy to do that. Um, thank you to Con Home for the invitation to join you on the panel today. But as you said, um, Mads, the, the problem uh, in the UK is, is an enormous one. We have the oldest housing stock in Europe uh, by far. Uh, we have almost uh, three million homes that were actually built before the First World War. Um, and they are a huge multiplicity of different housing types uh, and tenures, styles, shapes, uh, etc. Um, and it, it's a massive challenge. It's also uh, an additional problem, it was a nice problem in some respects over the years, but uh, in the UK, traditionally, the vast majority of our space heating, something like 80%, has been uh, gas-fired, um, and that, of course, is because we've had access to abundant supplies of gas from the North Sea, uh, sadly uh, declining, as we are discovering in the current uh, crisis. So, um, in the concept of the, the, the the energy crisis at the moment, what I think found fascinating about it is the desire that everybody comes up with for quick solutions, and those quick solutions are always presented to us whenever there is a, an energy crisis, but of course nothing really can happen fast in energy policy. Rolling out uh, new stock, uh, new power stations, etc., takes often decades, um, but I love the desire of, of MPs and others to, what can we do now? What can we do? Uh, in July, the question was posed, what can we do now to affect this winter? And the answer, not an awful lot. 
But one of the things that we can do, uh, and indeed are doing, is roll out uh, insulation programs because the cheapest energy, of course, is the energy that you um, don't use. Um, so um, the good news is that we are making progress in this country. I'm sure we'd all like to make faster progress, but we are making progress. So in 2010, um, we had something like 14% of, of UK properties were EPCC or above, and EPC is... It's an imperfect measure, but it's a, it's, it's a rough uh, guide. Now that's up to 46%, um, principally due to, to various government schemes over the years, particularly uh, ECO and others. Um, in terms of direct government support over this parliament, uh, we're spending something like 6.6 uh, uh, billion um, of uh, measures primarily aimed at those on benefits and on the lowest income and those living off the gas grid because they're the most uh, difficult ones. Uh, if you include the eco scheme, which up until the Chancellor's announcements were uh, funded uh, as a surcharge on bills but is now uh, exchequer funded, then we'd be spending something like 12 billion over this parliament. So considerable uh, investment in, uh, in upgrading the nation's um, properties. Um, uh, Last week uh, was controversial in the, in, in the political announcements, but one thing that didn't get any publicity was actually another billion that we've managed to secure mm -hmm. from the Chancellor for uh, what's called Eco Plus, uh, which I can happily talk anybody through if they want the details of it, but it's an extension of the existing uh, Eco obligation, but again, Exchequer funded, and for the first time, uh, half of that will also go towards the so-called uh, able-to-pay uh, sectors. Uh, we still need to legislate for that, um, so it won't make a difference this winter, but we'll start to roll that out from uh, April next year. Uh, other things that I should mention, particularly as the chairman of the DCC is here, that we now have uh, 23 uh, million smart meters installed uh, in the UK. Um, I first took responsibility for this about uh, three years ago, when the majority of my correspondence was... Um, I don't want one of these bloody smart meters. Why are you forcing me to have one? The answer to which is we're not forcing anybody to have one. But what's been interesting, my post bag has now switched very much to I want one and I can't have one. I live in an area that doesn't have coverage or my supplier doesn't want to uh, supply me with one. So I think people's attitudes are slowly uh, changing and I'm a great believer in, uh, in carrots rather than sticks. So we won't be forcing anybody to have them. But uh, I think they're a great innovation um, being rolled out uh, well with one or two teething problems. But um, now it's a program that is delivering uh, benefits and indeed has already paid for itself. Um, take another example. Oh, a long answer, this apologies. <laughs> um, another example, uh, social housing. Uh, again, um, we're, we're doing a lot in this area. Only last week we uh, opened the latest range of, um, of bidding for 800 million of support to uh, local authorities, to housing associations, uh, and to charities, which would be match funded by them for another 800 million, so 1.6 billion pounds worth of investment in uh, social housing, another 800 million also for home upgrade grants targeted towards those uh, off the gas grid. So we are doing a lot in, in this area. I'm, I'm sure we could always do more, and we want to talk further on the panel about how we can incentivize people to invest for themselves, which actually is tricky. People are not we did some polling on this in the summer, are not, uh, not very happy, don't see the benefit of investing in efficiency measures for themselves, but we need to do a lot more in terms of green finance. And lastly, the supply chain is proving a problem at the moment. So uh, it's not so much the lack of available capital, although I'd always like to have more from the Treasury to spend, but it's, uh, there, there are real supply chain uh, issues in terms of uh, rolling out a lot of these uh, programs. People are finding it hard to get hold of trained installers, the, the quality uh, thresholds are difficult to maintain, and uh, particularly from uh, foreign uh, suppliers, it's really difficult to get hold of some of the key suppliers. Thank, that. thank you very much. Just one follow-up question quickly. Um, you know, as with so much in um, politics, it, it feels as if we have to wait for there to be some kind of enormous crisis to be jolted out of our complacency, and then we kind of hop to it to sort of belatedly correct the neglect of, of the preceding years. Do you, do you feel that there has been perhaps the, the, the kind of crisis period that, that, that we, we are living through, has that created a kind of sea change in public opinion about this and perhaps makes it easier to raise awareness about what's on offer? I, I'm, I'm, to a certain extent it has, um, but actually you know, we, 
in energy policy generally, we actually have a pretty good record in the UK. We are in a much better position, believe it or not, than most of the rest of, of Europe. You know, we already have fairly diverse uh, sources of energy. We have the largest offshore wind sector in Europe. By far, 50% of all offshore wind power in Europe is in the UK. Um, the officials that devised the contracts for different uh, schemes played an absolute blinder. That's now paying back uh, hundreds of millions of pounds into the system. And the rest of Europe, and I was in Germany for a conference last week talking to the German energy minister, they're all copying our success on this. So we have a very um, advanced program of rolling out uh, even, even more supplies, but it will be difficult because the supply chains, again, will be constrained as everybody else in Europe and in many other parts of the world are also trying to access the same supplies, the same, uh, the same turbines, the same blades, etc., because they want to do this again the same because of the cost reductions that you've seen primarily through us developing in the first place. Um, energy efficiency, there is more demand, I think, but we haven't seen, again, the, the massive uptake of, uh, of public demanding um, uh, measures be installed. One of the biggest problems, bizarrely, with the eco uh, scheme, and this is an obligation placed on suppliers to install energy efficiency measures, uh, is them finding people that want to have the measures installed. Um, one of the big suppliers told me that they spend 30 to 40 percent of the budget just in finding people who want to have stuff done to their homes for free for them, which is quite bizarre. Thank you so much. Um, David, I'd like to come to you, if, if I may, um, and perhaps you could tell us a little bit and perhaps answer, answer the question of you know, what the role of finance could be in supporting people to improve the energy performance of, of their homes. Yeah, sure, and, and thank you for, for having me. Um, I suppose we spoke to the event, so that, that, <laughs> that did help with the invitation. Um, you know, but you know, as we look at it now, we've put out a, a very clear mandate for ourselves that 50% you know, of our mortgages or more uh, by 2030 will be EPC, uh, A, B, or C. Um, and uh, you know, we put that out with all the best of intentions, and the reality is there just isn't the demand for that to be filled. And as we sit here today, we're at about 38%, and, and we're just not making progress. And you know, that's really why I wanted to come today and, and talk about this, because it's an issue, and the reality is the only thing that really matters when somebody buys <coughs> a home is money. And it doesn't matter. I, I met someone who said, uh, when someone says to me, money doesn't matter, I wonder what else they lie about. <coughs> and you know, you just bought a home. You just paid more than you wanted to for your home. Uh, your financing costs have gone up uh, more than we want them to. Uh, and if I had any money left over, I'd put it in a new kitchen. And so what we're facing here is this issue where there just isn't the demand. Uh, now, the good news is there is a plan. And we published a plan. We're not the only people to have published a plan. And I think with coordinated effort, we could get somewhere. And you know, one of the things I wanted to point out, and, and I'm happy to talk about the plan, maybe not in this answer, but, but, but you know, one of the things I did want to really point out is, is now is probably as good a time as I've ever known for us to do something. Because you know, we've got four of the, the most politically relevant topics right now all feeding into this. So you know, on the one hand, you've got um, uh, the obvious climate agenda. You know, there are people who do care about the planet. At the same time, we've got a cost of living crisis. And if we do this right, we can resolve that crisis, not just today, but for the long run. Um, we have an energy security issue like we've probably never faced before. This plays directly into uh, the energy security issue. And, and lastly, and not least importantly, is we, we do have a pro-growth agenda. And when you look at the numbers, you know, this is a 300 billion pound price tag to retrofit Britain's homes, that's an industry waiting to be developed. And so, you know, if we do create the demand, if we do create the supply chain, if we do create the financing tools, all of which I'm happy to talk about, we have something that ticks all four of those boxes. And I, I really think the time, the time is now for us to do something. Should we also be seeing energy efficiency and the, the route to greater energy efficiency as a kind of uh, a avenue for growth in and of itself? Well, yes. Uh, you know, um, again, if right now this industry doesn't exist. So one of the issues, and we'll talk about all the issues, I'm sure, but one of the issues, and it's been already mentioned, is there just isn't the supply chain. So mm -hmm. if someone came to me and said, here's all the money you need, go make your house energy efficient, I would have no godly idea what to do next. Um, well, but by creating the demand, you're going to create the industry that satisfies that demand, and that is something that's going to create growth. So. 
you know, I, I think this is really pro growth, uh, and and these are uh, not just things that we can invent that will create a GDP growth. These are things ultimately we can export. Now, a lot of it's labor, but but what we create can be exported, both in terms of, of capability and the infrastructure. And if we're not careful, we'll be importing it after somebody else does it. Great. Thank you. Um, I think, Martin, I'd like to hear a little from you about the work that you do and perhaps also about um, the kind of the, the way in which is this even something that is on the radar of the people that you, you work with and speak to? I mean, very much so. So um, my organisation is a fuel poverty organisation. We're at the, the, the hard edge of people really struggling to get by with an energy supercharged cost of living crisis. And there tends to be three moments that they, they think about. One is the winter. And to be honest, the only thing that's going to help them in winter, notwithstanding the enormous intervention of the price guarantee, is probably going to be even more targeted financial support or support through organizations like mine. There's the length of the crisis to the extent to which the energy circumstances keep driving it forward. And then there's kind of lots of other mechanisms, regulatory me mechanisms that are needed. But the, mov the movement from the, from the winter to the crisis to the transition is where an en energy efficiency is the fundamental <laughs> intervention to stop mopping up the flood and start turning off the tap. Because for an organization like mine, it's not just carbon and it's not just costs, it's comfort. It's the idea that your home is a sure place to start your life and your children's life. It's a place of refuge and reassurance and comfort and solidity. And you don't have that if your home is impossible to heat and it's cold and it's damp and there's mushrooms on the wall and you don't want your children living there. So absolutely, some of the issues that so when I'm very supportive of the, uh, I, I, my mind says I, I wish we would go further with the socially focused energy efficiency programs, but they do something really important, things like eco and the social housing decarbonisation fund and what we get from hugs and LAD. The success that we've had in those energy efficiency programs, as opposed to the vouchers and the, the, those individual transaction, is because you have large institutions, local authorities and energy suppliers, um, for all that it's difficult to, 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 the search costs can sometimes be quite high, is you have them driving down contractor costs, you have them insisting on levels of quality and assurance and redress and insurance and delivering uh, outcomes that consumers can benefit from. Because I think you're absolutely right, there is a fundamental market weakness in energy efficiency. Suppliers are too small, uh, consumers don't know what they need, they don't know who to get it from. They don't know what payback is like. They don't know what success looks like. They don't know what redress looks like. So even if there's incipient demand, there's a the recognition that there should be demand, it's very difficult to go out there and understand what demand would look like in transactional yeah. terms and what you get back from it. And that is a market failure. And I think the great strength, and if we could invest more through those social deliveries, social landlords, energy obligated suppliers, local authorities, is that you can start making markets, at least start making supply chains and that is setting standards and obligations and people on the streets knowing what they should be getting from it. It's an absolutely essential part that's, that's missing is consumer confidence in being able to transact with that. So I think that's vitally important for, for our organization as a fuel poverty organization, people having to spend 10% of their income to afford a decent level of heat. It's about four and a half million households last October. It's about 6.7 million households now and we hope that the energy prices will come down and lessen that, but nonetheless, that's a great big chunk. The only, there is no pathway to net zero or decarbonized energy system that doesn't go through the homes in the poor of the poor. You get the best and biggest results from doing that first. You can organize it through obligated suppliers and you can make markets. So the, the short answer to the question, it is the most fundamental sustainable solution to people who are being the most battered and in the most jeopardy health and income by the cost of living crisis and we have to do more and unless we do more we will just continue to get I mean the Prime Minister was talking about getting good value for money for the taxpayers pound for all that we welcome the energy price guarantee you're not getting very good value for money from it because most of it's using to heat the home and the sky so it would be a, such a good investment all the growth issues that alongside the able to pay incentives we figure out how we're going to help people for whom return on capital investments in assets is a foreign language. Thank you very much, Adam. I'm sorry I called you Martin by mistake. My brain always goes to mush after two days of conference. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I think I'd like to
like to come to you, Jennifer, if I may. Um, ha having worked in government and focusing on the delivery of, of these initiatives, I'd like to get a sense of what you see as the obstacles that are preventing people from making changes now, which, you know, is with bills rising, the return on the investment would be therefore greater. Yeah, thank you very much, Matt. Um, and it's, I'm delighted to see that Lord Callanan has retained his role in the government. Uh, fantastic to see someone who understands energy efficiency um, doing, doing the jobs. Um, well, listen, four weeks ago today, I was clearing out my desk at number 10 and making my way home. Um, and my time on the sofa uh, has given me time to reflect on uh, what could have been and what may still be on the energy efficiency front. Um, so over the summer, I and hundreds and hundreds of Martins officials um, worked on a comprehensive energy package and crucially on a refreshed energy narrative. So not just energy efficiency, but energy overall. And there were two schools of thought. Uh, one was to announce uh, increased bill support, which is called the energy price guarantee now. Um, quickly um, and then deal with the wider package and a refreshed energy narrative later. And the other, which I favored, was to reset the energy narrative from day one. Events obviously got in the way, not least um, my employment, um, <laughs> but also um, the sad death of the Queen and the national mourning. So we will never know um, what was planned and how it might have gone differently. Um, but, um, regrettably, what has come out thus far has been piecemeal. Um, I've not seen the polling, uh, but I suspect that the energy cap is widely misunderstood. A unit cap is a good idea. Uh, it still incentivizes less consumption, but it needs to be accompanied by accessible advice and easy to access solutions. I mean, if I asked the audience to be honest, how many of you before today or before this fringe thought that there was a ceiling on your energy bills of 2,500 pounds? Did anyone think that that was the, the cap on energy? No, we're all a very well-informed audience, okay. Um, two people. When I speak to my friends and family, and I'm in from Le leafy southwest London, most of them think there's been a cap of 2,500 per household or for the average household which of course is not true. It's a unit cap, which is a much better idea, but needs to be explained. So there's a fundamental misunderstanding, and I, I, I worry that's going to lead to um, unexpected um, hardship for a number of families um, of all demographics and um, locations over the next winter. Um, so not only that, but there was an opportunity um, to announce, as I said, a comprehensive energy package and a refreshed energy narrative, um, hopefully with subsidized and co-payment options available for fabric uh, improvements. Um, politicians um, of all stripes, but especially conservatives, are very wary of preaching austerity. Um, they'll be inevitably attacked in the media and online as telling people to suffer, um, you know, you don't care about the children, you want pensioners to freeze to death, et cetera, et cetera. And this is really unfortunate because deprivation is not the same as restraint. Restraint, moderation, and conserving natural resources are fundamental conservative values. And I do think that there is an appetite to be more energy efficient, efficient although not necessarily an appetite to go out and fit the measures. Um, because as others have said, people don't know what they are, who to get to do them, how to do them, what, what sequence they should do them in, et cetera. Um, I think this because um, we saw in COVID, we saw during the pandemic a real coming together and a sense of solidarity to uh, look out for one another and to ensure the NHS wasn't overwhelmed and to do the right thing and wash our hands and wear masks. And I think we're in a similar position, very, very different, but similar in the sense of it's a scale of the challenge, right? We are in uh, an era where energy is tight, where energy prices um, are sky high. And actually, as um, Lord Kellanan said, um, the cheapest energy is that which we don't use. 
So I think there is a way for us to all take um, advantage of this, I would say, unique opportunity. Uh, for government to work collaboratively with NGOs, business, civic society, to facilitate significant improvements in buildings, to demand shift, and um, to encourage behavioral change. Uh, none of this requires privation. It does <coughs> require some funding, but at least there would be a payback on that money spent. And I think, um, whilst I welcome the energy package, indeed I worked on it, um, sort of day and night for, for many, many weeks. Um, I think there was an opportunity to have a conversation with the country about how um, this is what the government had done, this is what the government was doing, was going to make available, and this was the responsibility and the opportunity for all of us to do our bit. So I hope that that will still come, mm. um, but I think that would be um, a massive step forward. Um, Given the impact of the energy support package on public finances and the fact that it's not being paid back on bills as was originally the idea, the government itself has a huge incentive to really grasp the nettle on this and have a, a conversation, um, factual, honest conversation with the public about practical steps um, that they can take and to help, help them do that. Um, despite the UNICAP, um, as I said, many will still struggle with the rise in energy bills, um, and I really hope um, that the government seizes the opportunity to run a comprehensive, collaborative energy efficiency program wrapped in a refreshed, balanced energy narrative. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I think you've probably heard enough from me already, so I'd like to now go to the audience for questions. I think there is a mic um, somewhere at the back perfect um, so you know if you could raise your hands Mike will come to you if you could please state your name and where you're from and keep it concise please um, and um, fantastic so I think we'll start with the lady at the front here in the blue in the black jacket We're, oh yeah, okay. Yep. Oh, hi, uh, my name is Tilly Smith. I'm from Generation Rent. Uh, so the private renter sector has the worst housing stock of any other tenure uh, in terms of EPC ratings. Uh, we hear all the time from renters who are just finding it impossible to rent their homes. Uh, it's only going to be getting worse this winter. I wonder what the panel thought about how we make sure that private renters are included uh, in this uh, in, in, in uh, the this green energy uh, movement that we're talking about here. Great. Adam, why don't you start on that one? Uh, it, it is one of the most difficult sectors. I mean, the tenure is an important kind of issue, kind of homeowners, social landlords. Uh, but private renter sector is, is tricky, part of the heterogene heterogeneity of, of, of them. Look, I think the answer is at least in two parts. And one is the uh, effective and quite stringent minimum energy efficiency standards and then the enforcement of those. But not all landlords are failing in those obligations because they're, you know, they're venal and they want their kind of tenants to be cold. A lot of them suffer from the same issues about the value of payback and about what they should do in their home. So I think there's a need to be a kind of with landlords to try and help them understand the benefits to their, their assets. But, but fundamentally, it is such a, a difficult and challenging kind of issue that without certainty, as in most sectors, without certainty that you know what it is that you need to do and what the penalties of not doing it will be and the, the routes to be able to make your homes more energy efficient, I don't expect that people will do it. So I think <coughs> the standards are important, enforcement is, is really important, support as well, but just certainty about what it is they have to do, what is their contract with their, with their tenants and with the rest of the, the climate uh, as being a private landlord. Um, Martin, what, what, what do you make of that? Sure, well, I mean, as the lady will know, we consulted in the uh, last summer on raising the standard. At the moment, you need um, uh, EPCE before you to rent any property. We consulted on raising that to C uh, and capping the landlord contribution at, uh, at £10,000 per, per property. Um, I, I, I'll be honest with you, it's a difficult uh, area. We're genuinely undecided about how to proceed with this. Um, and the reason is, is very simple, that um, we don't want to disincentivize private landlords in the market. And the difficulty, of course, is that the landlord pays the, uh, the bill for the upgrade, but the tenant gets the benefit. And 
my post boxes full of, of letters from uh, landlords, particularly in rural areas, saying, well, if you impose these standards, it's not worth me upgrading uh, whatever particular property you've got. might be fine for a half a million pound flat in London, but for a 60,000 pound tenancy uh, tenement on, on Tyneside, it's, it really doesn't provide any payback, uh, and therefore I will just sell it. And therefore, the property will still exist. It will just be in the, the owner-occupied sector rather than the um, private rented sector. Um, and you know, a lot of rural areas, people are saying if they're single-skin, stone-built properties, etc., often the only properties available for rent in a particular area, then um, they will just uh, sell them off and, and drive people out of, uh, out of the lettings market. So I want to see um, standards raised. Um, whether now is the right time to impose all these additional costs on landlords, I'm genuinely not sure. We haven't made a final decision on that yet. We will issue a response to the consultation as soon as we, uh, as soon as we make a, a decision. But it is a really difficult dilemma. And I've had a lot of people both in the landlord sector, but actually in the housing sector as well, saying you have to be careful how you proceed in, in this area. We don't want to reduce any further the disincentives for private landlords. Fantastic. Um, I don't know if either of you two would like to have a go answering that question, but it's, we, or we can move on to another uh, audience question. Um, could I have the lady standing at the back there, please? So I'm not being sexist. I'll pick a man next, I promise. <coughs> I don't. <laughs> I'm um, Hannah Vickers. I'm chief of staff at Mace Group, so we work supply side. Um, and so one of the things that's really important for us to start to invest and, and scale up if you like to make sure that we can deliver um, on the retrofit plans would be certainty and confidence. So things like social housing decarbonisation fund, brilliant. We know where we are with that. We can see and we will, you know, and we are investing to be able to deliver on it. I'm interested because there's a bit of nervousness around the Skidmore review that actually some of the things that we have seen which we thought would give us confidence in the heat and building strategy and the net zero strategy, you know, private uh, landlords as one example because there is published policy on that. I'm quite interested in whether we're still going to have some certainty about how the different segments will be tackled, whether it's regulatory or funding, which will allow us to invest collectively in, uh, in sort of getting the market ready to, to deliver on those different segments. Great. I wonder if, Jennifer, if perhaps you might, have, um, you might be able to respond to that point about creating um, a, an environment of, of certainty for investment going forward. Yeah, I mean, maybe um, I can bear that and the previous question in mind on PRS. Um, I think if we're really going to get people to invest um, in the PRS, we need to think about tax incentives for landlords. Um, as other panelists said, um, it, taxation in the PRS is highly punitive for small landlords. Um, you're taxed on revenue, not on profit. Um, and so there's, it's very difficult. Many small landlords are, are loss making, um, and you know many have left left mm -hmm. the market, and many more may, many more may still. Um, that's obviously not the case for larger landlords who own dozens or hundreds of properties and have them incorporated, um, and are in a different scenario. Um, so I would almost treat those as two separate buckets. But I think that would work very well for small landlords. Um, if they were able to um, have that sort of uh, revenue expenditure treated differently, um, having a full exemption for energy efficiency improvements, I think would make a massive difference. I also think, going back to my opening remarks around the opportunity we have, um, I worked for the Energy Saving Trust for a number of years, and um, you know, you just couldn't give it away. Um, and that's still the case all these years later. Um, but if we're ever going to be able to give it away, it's going to be now, right? It's going to be in this environment with high prices where um, we're in a cost of living crisis where people are concerned um, about their bills. And that is married with concern about the climate. And so if we make it really easy for people, then hopefully they will act. And I think that's where I think the, the energy offer from the government could be a little bit more carrot and stick. Um, to say, you know, this is what we're doing for you, but this is what we need you to do um, to help keep overall consumption down, um, to reduce future bills, reduce the burden on the exchequer, reduce the burden on the next generation in terms of payback, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in terms of certainty, I mean, ECO and all of its um, forerunners have been around for a very long time. 
Um, I don't know, there may be those of you in the audience who remember um, all the different acronyms that we've had to get to, get to know over the decades. Adam will know. <laughs> Should I put you on the spot, Adam? Can you think of a couple? I can think of, of CESP and CERT and, uh, CERT? and a few others yes. that we've, we've had. Uh, what else? As well. book. CESP. CESP? Anyone else remember CESP? No, see, you're all newcomers. <laughs> um, so I, I think, um, you know, we could be more ambitious. We could be more ambitious with these programs. They have been very successful in and of themselves, but there's obviously still um, lofts to lag and cavity walls to fill and all the rest of it. So um, the problem we have, of course, is we don't want to put additional surcharges on bills in such a high cost environment. Um, so maybe that's something that has to wait and we need to ramp that up come 2025 when um, we're through this current energy challenge and uh, we are in that secure, more affordable, um, greener future. Um, and maybe that's something we need to go for a full, full tilt. Great. Um, I think, Martin, if you come in briefly and then I shall take sure. another question from the audience. Okay. Uh, well, I don't know if the lady was here for my opening remark, but we just launched the, the biggest ever tranche of funding for the SHDF um, last week. Um, pleased to be able to get the go-ahead from the Treasury uh, for that. There was a question mark about it at one stage. Uh, and, of course, matched with funding from the sector as well. That will be about 1.6 uh, billion uh, funding. Um, and the biggest question from, from my point of view is will we get enough bids from local mm -hmm. authorities and house associations to, to spend that money? So, you know, please, please, please bid. I don't want to give it back to the Treasury, <laughs> which I've had to do on uh, some previous schemes. And actually, the social housing sector is one of the better performing sectors, mm -hmm. and much better performing than the, Kate's nodding here, um, than the uh, PRS uh, sector. Um, and there's been some really uh, great innovations in the area. Um, I totally get your point about long-term certainty of funding, um, and you can be assured this is a point that both myself and officials make all of the time to the Treasury, but they work on shorter timescales, but we are impressing on them all the time. It's much better, rather than saying, here is you know, 800 million in one year, 200 million a year over four years, it's actually much better for the supply chain, much easier for the sector to, uh, to absorb. So I hope you'll think that uh, in this round of funding, we are giving a much longer delivery period precisely for that uh, reason. Um, and obviously, I hope I can't commit beyond the current spending review, but I hope that, uh, that we will be able to provide long-term funding on that to build on the supply chains that are developed because the whole of this sector for too long has been too start-stop. We, we get that, absolutely. <coughs> Great. Um, I have the gentleman here at the front in the blue tie. Hello. Uh, hello, I'm William Wood from uh, Westminster North uh, Association and I was wondering, you were saying earlier about the, um, the gas that we had, the offshore gas. Would it be, is it not time now to start looking at other ways of, of generating cleaner electricity using uh, some of the British overseas territories such as the British Antarctic Territory, which is, um, especially in the south with Queen Elizabeth land, there's so much space, could be used for solar panels, this could be, this could help to alleviate some of the, the pressures and costs of electricity in general. Is, it, is, it, is now the time to think outside the box with reference to the overseas territories? Well, yes, but you've got to get that power to the UK. It's actually a really exciting project um, from looking at um, Morocco at the moment, where mm. a huge amount of solar panel and panels uh, and, and wind turbines and actually transporting that through a long distance interconnector to the UK, and that's actually commercially viable and is being planned and, and delivered uh, at the moment, hugely uh, exciting. And the costs of uh, installing these really long undersea cables, fantastic technology, are really, really dropping. But I think the Antarctic territories might be a bit of a stretch. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. <laughs> oh, the la oh, the lady with the blue top, just there. Thank you. I'm Georgie and I'm from St Albans constituency. Um, I feel like a question hasn't really been talked about much. In the media at the moment, there's so much negativity when it comes to energy efficiency. I feel like when you say um, energy efficiency, people like Martin Lewis immediately go and say, well, you're not actually solving the problem in terms of energy price. And so how would you mm. combat those negative perceptions around energy efficiency and get towards creating that market where there is demand? That's a really interesting question. Um, I think perhaps 
Adam, would you like to speak a little about this? Uh, a, a little. I mean, I think that, look, one of the big, there's energy efficient, there's energy saving, there's energy efficiency. Energy saving is cutting back or, you know, putting your thermostat down by, by one degree and it's kind of doing, getting your flow temperature and your boilers working. Uh, there's lots of, you know, kind of one percenters, five percenters there. The, the big challenge around energy efficiency, and I think it's bedeviled kind of policy making, is this idea that it's disruption and it's friction and we can't impose that on people. Our clients say disruptors, because what you're disrupting is not livable in, you know, because the level of comfort and distress is so high. So different, we're, you know, consumers and householders are notoriously, you know, heterogeneous bunch. They're very different. They have different kind of motivations. I would disagree, though. I think that you have a pretty unanimity of thinking that energy efficiency, if you can do it, if you can find it, if you can make it work, if you can value it properly, not just in cost and carbon terms, is really pretty attractive. What people don't like is having to clear the lofts yeah. and kind of and, and getting the disruption in it. And, and we just got to find a way of getting people to to understand that the benefits of that, not just in terms of individual budgets, but also in terms of healthy environments and kind of safe environments and kind of ecological environments, are so strong, and it's such a shared imperative and a common purpose that we should be able to do it. But we've got to make it easy kind of, for people. So I, I, I would disagree that I think there's a huge amount of, of, of opposition to energy efficiency. People would love to know what it meant and how it would be applicable in their own circumstances, how it would repay back if you're kind of paying for it yourself, how you can be supported if you're unable to, to afford it. But the moment is absolutely, is absolutely now. But I make this point over and over again. There are lots of people who don't like the disruption. There are millions of households, 6.7 million households, not all of them in energy and efficient programs, who would say, please come in, make my home dusty, disrupt it, tear things off walls, put something on those walls so I can live a decent life. Great. Um, Martin, I wonder if you might be able to, um, what is your take on this? Do you, I think you, we as humans are naturally change averse creatures, aren't we? Um, do you think that there is a kind of Debbie Downerism in the media about energy efficiency? Or has that been overestimated? I, th I think there is to a certain extent. I think uh, in the debate, people I think look f in, in, in the crisis, I talked about it in my opening remarks, people want quick and easy solutions. You know, why don't we frack? Why don't we have a new nuclear power station? Both of which I'm, I'm not against. But they all take time to being online. Whereas Energy efficiency is millions of little, small, tiny interventions up and down the country in, in hundreds of thousands of different homes. So it's kind of more difficult to, to get a handle on. It's more complicated to do, and it's not an easy, quick, politically sellable um, solution. But it is undoubtedly an important solution. And I think people's attitudes are changing, just driven purely by the cost of energy being bloody expensive and wanting to use less of it. And you know, there is lots of things that uh, people can do, and um, Adam touched on it. The, most amazing one um, recently, which I'll confess until a year ago I wasn't aware of, was turning your boiler flow temperature down. The boil boilers are set um, yeah. too high by default. And oh. it's very easy to change the flow temperature down to about 60 or 65, depending yeah. on how big the radiators in your house are. It's complicated. But you get the same temperature. You don't suffer any loss of comfort. It takes slightly longer to get up to temperature. But if you've got a modern condensing boiler, it works much more efficiently in a more constant phase at those uh, temperatures rather than at 70 degrees, which feels better and feels warmer, but it's switching on and off uh, more and not operating and more efficiently. So you can save up to 10% of your gas bill just by doing that and not suffering any loss of comfort at all. So getting that advice out there, which we're doing through our new website, is, is important to try and do. And the energy companies also, Octopus are one company who are working really hard on that. And uh, they can see demonstrable savings through smart meters that people are, people are managing to achieve by doing this. So very quickly, one question for me um, before I go back to the audience again. David, is this an issue that you've encountered when you're trying to let it be known, the kind of options that are available from NatWest and green financing, that there is just a lack of awareness? Do you see that as an obstacle to making progress there? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there are some really big issues. One of them is absolutely a lack of awareness. Um, we have green mortgages, and some people avail themselves of it, mostly people we tell about the green mortgage, and if their house is already green, they avail themselves of a lower rate, as opposed to that being an incentive for people. But you know, education is an issue. But you know, I go back to we've been talking a lot about the capability. You know, I think the big issue is we don't have demand. When you don't have demand, you don't have a market, 
and we don't have a market, we don't have capability, and to me it's, it's, it's rather simple. I know it's a very complicated topic, but that element of it, that sequence is really simple. And so, you know, if we don't really figure out how to create demand, uh, we're not going to have any of this work out for itself. And, you know, we don't need to figure out the technology because the market will figure out that technology once the demand exists. And, you know, we've thought about, you know, how do you create the demand? And, and, and it's very expensive and it's very hard to do in the duration of ownership. You know, we think it's the point of sale. And, and, uh, and we think if you, if you got something at the point of sale which would actually give incentive to upgrade your home then and there before you sold it or after you bought it two years mm -hmm. hence, and there's different models and there's lots of smart people working this out, but if you had the courage to say, right, we're going we're gonna to do something with stamp duty and it's going to include this, mm -hmm. you know, then you have the beginning of demand and, and then you start to see you know, positive dynamics. You would expect me to say this, but you know, I trust the market. You know, and if not the market, who is going to build all this <coughs> stuff? You know, we, we can't just have endless, you know, government work trying to build something. The market needs to pick it up at some point. We just need the incentives. Can I, I just raise a point on that. I think that's an interesting question. Ask yourself, how many people look at the running costs of a home when they buy it? How many people look at the EPC and say, no. actually, I prefer that flat because it's a B as opposed to that flat that's a C? No. Actually, hardly anybody. No. Bizarrely, even though no. uh, the, the energy costs are something you're going to be incurring year on year for many years to come. Um, you know, take the example of my son who's just uh, bought with his friend his first flat in, in London. You know, he, he's got a degree, he's not stupid. He didn't even know what the heating system was when he bought the flat. <laughs> <laughs> Please could go to the gentleman here in the front. Of the front. It's pretty efficient, it's brand new. But <laughs> <laughs> Outing your son in a conservative home. Yes. <laughs> in London, no less. Hi. <clears throat> uh, Greg Sinclair from Telford. We have a massive building programme going on and they're still building houses which need to be upgraded. Uh, but that's not the question. Uh, if you take a pie chart of 100, about 5 or 8% of that pie chart is emissions from houses. And almost the rest of it is from industry. So what are you doing about industry reducing its emissions through insulation and, or whatever else it might be? I think this might be one for Martin. Yes. Yeah. ESOS. <laughs> is the answer to use another acronym to confuse the energy savings opportunity scheme uh, yes there are um, again we we're, we have a number of schemes ongoing both uh, grant aided and uh, regulation driven to uh, drive uh, businesses and industry so large companies will have to get an energy audits done of their of their consumption and they will have to uh, report on it and, and take action to, to deliver it in some respects um, again, it was a wider program of work um, which we've um, paused at the moment in terms of imposing uh, additional standards on commercial premises yeah. on the basis that we don't want to impose any extra costs on businesses uh, at the moment. Um, but again, hopefully savvy businesses are starting to look at their energy costs and seeing what the opportunities are to actually reduce their usage. And some businesses are really good at it, particularly some of the big property companies are now looking because, of course, um, tenants are also looking at running costs of buildings now and, and businesses are very, very conscious of the cost of operating their premises. And if, if I could come in on this, I mean, this is another place where financiers mm -hmm. play a role. Okay. And, and, you know, there's sort of two elements of it. First, we, we actually do have funding available uh, for people that do want to make their businesses more energy efficient and, and, and transition uh, to net zero. But then we also have very strict requirements. And so if you're in oil and gas, as an example, you, you must have a credible transition plan to, to receive funding. So I think... I think there, there, we have talked about incentives, but I think industry is also stepping up and, and I think finance is stepping up to say, well, there are disincentives and incentives because every single one of our, our customers does need to have a long-term transition plan. And what's so remarkable about it is customers want it because I think they know, particularly the larger customers, they know they have to get to a much better place if they're going to succeed into the future. And so if there's support with that, they're happy to take that support. Fab. Um, now, the gentleman in the back of the blue suit, I've promised we'll have the next question, so. Thank you. Mike Leonard from the uh, Building Alliance. I just wondered uh, what the panel's view is on the level of interventions into properties. Um, you know, given that we've got fuel property and that's going to be a major uh, feature over the next uh, period of time, um, deep retrofits costing 60, 70, 80,000 pounds per property, would it be better to focus on uh, a much lower level of intervention at scale and, and have a real effect rather than sort of messing around with uh, projects that don't actually pay back. Yes. 
um, I think perhaps Martin and, and Jennifer could answer on this one. Um, sure. Well, I mean, actually, the new uh, Eco Plus scheme, which we're hoping to roll out from uh, April, is doing precisely that. It's concentrating. So the Eco 4, the original one, um, the original one, newish one, which is <laughs> in the summer, uh, building on the previous Ecos, uh, is, is very much uh, whole house retrofit, which, as you correctly say, is eye-wateringly expensive and getting more so, whereas the uh, new Eco scheme will very much, the additional one, will very much concentrate on exactly that. So it'll be concentrating, and we're still working out the final policy design, but it'll probably be on three measures. So it'll be um, you know, loft insulation, um, heating controls, cavity wall insulation if the property hasn't got it. So relatively low cost uh, interventions uh, in both the uh, able to pay and the um, lower income specific mm. uh, sectors uh, as well. So yeah, that, that, that is the purpose of that additional scheme. So it's rolling out stuff relatively quickly, but simple and easy to do is the idea. What, sorry? <coughs> uh, it's, not, it, it, it's not in a list, you're right. In terms of, in terms of whole house retrofits, absolutely, ventilation is totally key. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, understand that. Yeah, that um, trade-off between whole house and, and um, sort of in-depth or, mm -hmm. or broad across um, is very, very live conversation. Um, perhaps always, but um, certainly in my, in my time in number 10. And um, I was very much pushing for um, the new version of Eco to try to reach as many people as possible. I mean, whilst Thank there you are to Jennifer for her work and support <laughs> on that in the summer, by the way. <laughs> um, listen, while there are still lags to loft and cavity walls to fill, I mean, we should do them, right? And we should do them as quickly as possible. It's um, really obvious... Um, semi-quick wins, um, supply chain willing to, to do, um, and heating controls along with that. Um, I think with whole house retrofits, I think um, that's probably something that will need to be looked at again. Um, I am really conscious of, um, you know, when you're in number 10, you think about, uh, and Bayes, you think about the country as a whole. And one of my concerns while I was in there and, and, and still remains um, that we're not subsidizing uh, waiter shoppers to get new heating systems. You know, there's an element of some of the programs which I think, you know, don't perhaps put the, the finite resources the government has where it's most needed. And I think there's an opportunity to reform those programs to make sure that people in those really hard to heat properties are helped through a combination of fabric first measures or moved into new build properties with higher standards. And I'd rather have that money spent that way. Um, I think for those of us who are lucky enough to be able to afford, you know, a heat pump, um, then the market will provide those financial packages. Um, you know, perhaps we can save up, whatever. But I, I, I just have a bit of discomfort with some of the um, whole house retrofits. Um, that some sections of civic society push solid wall insulation in period homes, another um, bugbear of mine. It's not a good use of public funding. Um, I just don't believe it's where we should be putting our money when there's so much good that needs to be done on the energy efficiency front. So I shall, I shall end my comments on those somewhat contentious <coughs> points. <laughs> Madeline. Yes, the gentleman here, please. Thank you very much. Simon Richards from BCW. Um, can I just pick up on, on exactly that point? Because yeah. I think with the, the conversation around energy efficiency is so often, we, we're just at another fringe, so often move straight to insulation at full stop. And actually the sort of inefficient heating systems and the amount that that's costing uh, our society and residents, both domestic and commercial. But just on, on your point, Jenny, but then also maybe to the minister as well, what, what do you think the sort of touch points are or could be to look at inefficient heating systems? If you think about gas, you have almost sort of annual checks. Well, heating systems, there's sort of nothing. I mean, they could be built into the sort of sales, stamp duty or whatever, but have you looked at whether that you could create more touch points for society to continually or sort of mandate continually to check what the heating systems are in their, in, in their location and sort of update them accordingly. What are you Thank referring you. to? Well, inefficient heating systems, what are you talking about? 
radiators or, or okay. into the actual heating system and what the pumps that go into them as well how I mean some of that 10 15 years old I think this I saw a stat the inefficient heating systems there are about 50 million across Europe that are costing however much I don't know in terms of emissions but there's just in terms of the loss from that a 10-year-old boiler doesn't sound so old for me, but maybe, maybe that I'm showing my age with we that. Are, I mean, we, we, we are looking at, um, at gas boiler standards, and there are, we, we, we've actually got, I think, most of the efficiencies out of gas boilers yeah. now in terms of uh, driving them up. There are one or two uh, um, uh, product modifications that we can mandate, which, which will drive up standards slightly, but they're, yeah. they're pretty much at, at the top end of their range of efficiency piece of now. They're technology. I mean, and they are, they, are, they are pretty good in terms of what they are and what, and what they deliver. I think mean, the reality is that uh, if, we, if we're going to have to decarbonise all heating, and certainly our legal obligations suggest that we are, then we need to move away from gas boilers. So the question really should be, what are the alternatives? And to me, there's only one alternative, which is heat pumps. Um, the lady here, please. Um, second row from the back. Mm. Victoria Matthews, I'm from Valent. Uh, we're manufacturers of heat pumps and gas boilers, so a bit of everything. Um, we're talking about the um, about people going retrofit and, and going into people's homes, but people are homeowners generally are they hear that heat pumps are really expensive. They're not interested and they're turned off automatically. And yes, we've got funding in some sectors, but in the able to pay sector. People go on to the Times. It's going to read. It's going to cost them fifteen thousand pounds. They're not interested. So, first question is, what what can we do to make the installer, who's the touch point that's going to the home and doing the um, the annual service on the gas boiler, what can we do about that person to make sure that they're equipped with the tools and can do a future proof assessment of a home and give a homeowner a view of actually it could cost them five thousand pounds and with the boiler upgrade scheme, that's that's a viable solution. And then also thinking about um, reducing bills and emissions at the moment, given the, current, the cur current climate. As we sit here today, we're still building properties with gas boilers rather than heat pumps. And I am concerned that we're, we're creating problems for the, for the future. So just ha what does the panel think we can do about that at this point in time? Thank you. Martin, would you like to kick things off on that one? Maybe sure. answer the first question um, about giving the installers the tools that they need. Sure. Oh, I mean, obviously, there are lots of uh, great training going on from, mm -hmm. uh, from yourselves and, and Mr. Bosch, the other manufacturers uh, about heat pumps and uh, the heat pump manufacturers themselves are doing lots of great, I've been to visit and open indeed a number of the uh, installer training courses that are, are taking place uh, across the country. We're also subsidizing some uh, training providers as well. We did under LAD and we will do another tranche uh, shortly of uh, calling for general installers, not just heat pumps, but all uh, general retrofit uh, training. Um, I think you made a good point about building regulations uh, mm -hmm. standards. Um, and obviously, we have the new um, official standards kicking in in 2025. Personally, I think it's regrettable that we haven't done that earlier. I mm -hmm. think we really should have done. Um, the panel session could examine why that, in <laughs> fact, happened in public <laughs> policy, but that's <laughs> something to look at uh, separately. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think your point generally is, is, is well made. We need to educate people more, particularly installers. Um, I mean, heat pumps, whilst I said they are the only alternative, I think the only viable alternative at the moment, unless technology provides us with some great uh, solution in the future. Um, but they are complicated. They are expensive. Uh, most people don't understand them. They're not, you know, we've got used to gas boilers, which are brilliant. They're simple. They're efficient. They're easy to operate. You know, heat pumps are more complicated, and they've got a a box outside on the wall, etc., akin to an air conditioning unit, so they're not as easy to install, they're more complicated to use, they often oper operate at a lower flow temperature, etc. But ultimately, the only way that we can incentivize people to, uh, to take them up is to make their operating costs lower than gas boilers, which in the longer term um, involves adjusting the relative price of electricity to, to gas. That, and, and we have a long-term policy to do that, but you will understand at the moment it's yeah. not the time to to be interfering with the prices too much. Yeah, well, thanks. Um, can I take the question from the lady there with, mm. the, with the fringe just there? Thanks. Thanks. I'm Kay Anderson. I'm the Chief Executive of the National Housing Federation. Firstly, uh, Martin, very pleased with your reappointment. And I think, more importantly for us, thank you so much for getting the Social Housing Decarbonisation Fund Wave 2.1 out and over the line. 
whilst uh, it's never going to be enough money and we want it longer term, it is a really, really important statement of intent. And I think really importantly in terms of the conversation here around owner occupiers, around private renters, it has the ability to start creating markets, but really importantly, creating confidence from consumers if we do this well. And I think that that's a really important part of it. From the, the pilot phase and wave one, um, one of the things we've seen from working um, with you in the department and, and with members across the country is that the planning system is responding very ad hoc to this. It's not being very consistent. Uh, in some areas, it's quite permissive. One of the schemes I visited, uh, there were different types of planning consent for neighboring properties on the, on the same street. So it's a question about what we can do to, to actually create an enabling planning system so that we can speed this up. And then a second question is, um, it's great being on the, the Net Zero Building Council. Is that going to continue? Um, and if so, can we focus it a bit more on delivery and potentially actually on this, this shared consumer confidence? Because I think the social housing sector is really up for the challenge. It's not without, you know, it's going to be a huge amount of work over the next 30 years. But we need to get that confidence, the skills supply chain across sectors. And could the Net Zero Building Council help to do that? Thanks. I think perhaps, Martin, if you could answer all that, the points about the, getting the planning system to where it needs to be, and then maybe we could hear from Jennifer about um, progress of things under the next administration with, with the social housing. Uh, sure. Um, Net Zero Building Council, uh, yes, is the answer to that. We tend to continue with that. I think it's a useful uh, forum. Um, you, you, you made valid, I think, points about... Um, PRS and owner-occupier regulations. To be honest, I don't think we're going to be making a lot of progress on that in the near future. I think the, the appetite in government to impose additional costs on people at the moment, and it would be seen as imposing additional costs, I totally understand the, the long-term nature of it, uh, at the moment is probably close to zero, if I'm frank. Uh, but we will, we will look at that, and I said earlier we, were, we still haven't decided on the outcome to the consultation on the PRS uh, standards uh, yet. Um, thank you for your uh, kind words. Um, I'm relying on you to make sure we've got enough bids to spend <laughs> all the money so I don't give it back to the Treasury. Um, but very pleased to carry on working with you on that. Uh, planning, by the way. Uh, planning, yeah. It, local authorities. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and in some respects, it's a good thing. You know, with, we're not a set, totally centralised country. Different local authorities will interpret their, their planning uh, policies in different ways. Um, I'm not a huge believer in trying to impose on them. Um, we, we want to take them with us. One of the reasons that I'm supportive of all of the existing home glad schemes, etc., is that they work with local authorities. They give the money to local authorities. They are people who know their own areas better than um, myself or my official sitting in, in Whitehall. They know what's required in their areas and the, the, the policy mix that works in their, their, their particular towns uh, and cities. So I think they're also best placed to interpret the planning policies. Um, I would like it to be more permissive in some respects, but I understand the sensitivities in particular neighbourhoods. Actually, I think because we're quite short of time, I'll just rattle on to the next <laughs> few questions so we can get the last ones in. Um, the gentleman here, please. Thank you. Sorry. Hi, yeah, my name's David from uh, Rockwell Insulation Manufacturers. Um, so, uh, my, so not an insulation focused question, by the way, but I'm um, interested to hear you say, uh, Lord Calnan, about uh, the appetite for imposing costs on owner occupiers being very low, which I understand. And obviously, for those owner occupiers, you know, recently mortgage rates are going up, their own appetite's probably reduced quite a lot too. Um, so, does that mean that um, the role for government needs to, to increase? Because into, somebody's got to pay for it ultimately, haven't they, in, in, in all this mix? <coughs> Well, as I said, the uh, role of government is increasing and we are providing funding um, and for the first time the Eco Plus system that um, Jennifer and I worked on uh, over the summer, we are, we'll be rolling that out from probably early next year. Um, and so there is uh, uh, government support there. Uh, I was just being honest, I mean, we haven't made any final decisions about regulations, but I'm just being honest in what I think the appetite is at the moment for imposing uh, additional costs. Um, but. In any respect, I'm sure Rockwell will do very well out of it. I mean, <laughs> high energy prices are <laughs> high energy prices are great for loft insulation. So. I think I maybe have time for another two <coughs> questions. So, um, if we could go to the gentleman here, um, just, just in the middle there. 
Hi there, James Lindsay, Hampstead and Kilburn. Um, I want to ask around um, transition risk, net zero transition risk, particularly relating to logistics companies. And I know that particularly the providers, the freight providers of rail, road, uh, maritime, air, are going through their own transition program. Um, that's going to take time, um, and they've got their own net zero journey. While we're in that period, is there a worry on the panel that those supply chain issues, which Lord Canahan talked about in his opening remarks, are only going to get exacerbated, given that they're very closely related, the two risks? And how closely are you collaborating with the logistics uh, industry in order to ensure we can achieve those energy efficient homes in the near future? Great. I think perhaps that's also one yes. Martin to answer. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, I don't know if we should talk afterwards about this. I mean, we obviously talk, and I, I mentioned the supply chain because I think it's a, it, it actually, it's the thing that worries me the most, actually probably more than availability of finance, is that um, yeah. there just won't be the people available to deliver lots of these uh, measures. And of course, the logistics keys it, plays a, a key part uh, in that, but um, I'll allow Rockwool to put their own logistics in place. They're getting their own products to, to market. Um, but... Um, whether we're in specific contact with the logistics industries, I don't know, to be honest. Um, I know we obviously talk to all of the, the manufacturers, the suppliers, and the installers, but perhaps logistics is one that we should add to our list. Great. Um, any final questions at all? Great. Well, I'd like to thank you all so much for coming, and I'd like to say a huge thank you to this distinguished panel and to NatWest for sponsoring the event. Thank you so much. Thank you.